Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. A person cannot have a series on transistor circuit analysis and design without addressing the whole topic of load lines. Well, besides that, I have received more than one request to be sure to cover this very topic. Instead of trying to pack all of this into a single very long video, I decided to break this up into four shorter videos. In this video, I will be laying the foundations for understanding all of the rest of them. I will be answering the questions, what is this graph that I'm looking at all about? What is the anatomy of a transistor curve? What is a load line? What types of load lines are there? And what are the standard conventions used in all of this? If you have questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Let's begin by looking at the data that we're going to be creating our load lines with. Well, when we think of load line analysis, we are concerned with how the transistor itself is operating in the circuit. When we have a bipolar junction transistor circuit, there are two things we're interested in relative to the transistor itself. The first is the collector emitter voltage. The second is the collector current. Now, why the collector emitter voltage and not simply the collector voltage? Well, this is because we are interested in how the transistor itself is operating in the circuit and in what mode of operation. It is possible for a transistor to have 8 volts on its collector and still be in saturation. This is because its collector emitter voltage is in the region commonly referred to as a saturation region. What we are not seeing when we look at only the collector voltage is the emitter voltage. This is why transistor curve tracers traditionally produce graphs of how the collector current changes with respect to the collector emitter voltage. But there's one other factor that affects collector current, and that factor is the base current. We supply a fixed base current to the transistor and then plot the collector current as we increase the collector emitter voltage. And this is what we're seeing with each line in the graph. By doing this in a set number of base currents, we end up with a family of curves which help describe the transistor's operation. This is what we get when we use a transistor curve tracer. Now, as you can guess, this is very specific to the DC current gain of the transistor. With that said, the shapes of the curves do not change only the values associated with them. So, in general, you can take any generic family of curves and reassign values as needed to accommodate the design that you're working on. Now, let's spend a moment unpacking what we're seeing in the transistor curves. Well, I'm going to take just a single trace on a family of traces to help us understand what we're looking at. Now, before we begin, we have to set the overall picture. This curve is some specific base current flowing into the transistor. And this means that the base emitter junction is forward biased. It also means that it is sitting at 0.7 volts according to our standard model. Now, the reality is the actual base emitter voltage varies with base current but for the sake of the standard model and our discussion, I will stick with the ideal base emitter voltage of 0.7 volts. As we begin looking at our graph, the horizontal or x-axis is the collector emitter voltage. We are starting at a collector emitter voltage of 0 volts. The base collector junction is forward biased because the collector voltage is below the base voltage of 0.7 volts. As the collector emitter voltage increases, it has to exceed the voltage on the base in order to render the base collector junction completely reverse biased. 
collector current increases, but it does not adhere to the collector current equaling the base current times the DC current gain formula. This is referred to as the saturation region. It is a nonlinear region, and we do not want to operate here for amplifiers. Once the base collector junction is completely reverse biased, the formula IC equals beta times IB now officially applies. We have entered the linear or active region of operation. Now, if this were perfectly linear, then the line from here would be perfectly horizontal. But it's not. It has a slight upward slope. If we were to follow this slope back past the zero volt mark until the collector current equals zero, we arrive at what is called the early voltage, or VA. This changes with base current, but averages out to about 100 volts for a silicon transistor, which we use in our analysis and design. Here is the family of transistor curves we are going to be using. Now, I generated this family specifically for a DC current gain of 200 using a 2N3904 transistor. Now that we know what we're looking at with the transistor curve tracer curves, I need to define what a load line is and define the two types we will be looking at here. Well, load line analysis is a graphical analysis tool used for planning linear transistor design. It helps us to visualize the maximum possible voltage swing of the output and maybe even decide to move the quiescent operating point to provide a more symmetrical swing. In other words, it is a graphical method of seeing how the output of the transistor lives in its electronic world. Now, there are two distinct types of load lines. There is the DC load line and there is the AC load line. Now, the DC load line helps us see the whole possible range of the transistor circuit's operation from a DC perspective. What is the worst case collector current? What is the maximum output voltage? Where does the transistor live in this continuum when there is no input applied? This is called the quiescent point. The circuit is just sitting there keeping its world warm, doing no particular work at all. And then there's the AC load line. The AC load line helps us see how the transistor circuit responds to some time-varying signal being applied to its input. In some cases, the DC load line and the AC load line end up being, well, the same line. But when there are capacitive elements involved with the circuit, then the two lines can be very different. Developing the AC load line takes a few seemingly very strange steps to accomplish. Now, before we go too far, I need to point out some standard naming conventions used for all of this. Well, I need to introduce you to the standard conventions used to differentiate the DC world from the AC world in this process. All uppercase letters are used to designate the DC world. Thus, VCE, as you see it here, is the collector emitter voltage in the DC world. All lowercase letters are used to designate the AC world. Thus, VCE, as you see it here, is the collector emitter voltage in the AC world. I have also seen mixed case used to designate where the two are brought together into a single entity. In this light, you see here, VCE equals VCE plus VCE. Well, what this means is that the combined value of the DC and AC worlds, that's the capital V lowercase CE, is equal to the DC world value, that's the capital V sub capital CE, plus the AC world value, which is all in lowercase VCE. I will be adhering to this standard nomenclature in this video series.
Now we have some foundational stuff laid down that will help us to understand all that's going on as we move into actually doing some load line analysis. In the next video, I will be working with a very, very simple common emitter transistor circuit to demonstrate this whole process. There's a link for you to this video up in the corner and in the description. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and, of course, subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots!